this is, this is called Letter Stories. And this is a story about three kinds of letters and the marks they've made upon my life and my students. It's a story about penmanship. It's a story about calligraphy. And it's a story about the lost art of letter writing. I was born and raised in Huntington, West Virginia, into a family where penmanship was valued. My grandmother, Mabel Riggs Dunphy, was born in 1884. She was the daughter of an Ohio riverboat pilot, and she came of age when she went to secretary and when she came of age, she went to secretarial school in Cincinnati, Ohio. While there, she studied Spencerian script. This script was developed in 1850 with the intent that America needed a penmanship style, and I want to see what it looks like big. <laughs> um, with the intent that America needed a penmanship style that could be written quickly, legibly, and elegantly for matters of business correspondence as well as personal letter writing. At the turn of the century, when she learned this, she would have used a pointed pen, which she dipped in ink. And you can see the thicks and the thins that were achieved by applying pressure to the pen. Later, grandmother would transition from a dip pen to a fountain pen, which is what she wrote with during my youth. The fountain pen still allowed her to move wet ink on the page, although she had to sacrifice those graceful thicks and thins. Eventually, the fountain pen would be overshadowed by the ballpoint pen in the 1950s, and in the 1960s, the felt tip pen was introduced into the United States. Regardless of the tool, my grandmother always wrote using those lovely Spencerian letter forms with their elegant loops and detail. That muscle memory was ingrained into her writing DNA the last letters I ever received from her, she was in her mid-90s, her eyesight was failing, her hand shaky, but ever present were those remarkable letters. She lived to be 101. I took pride in my grandmother's exceptional penmanship and for good reason. My mother, Lila Ruby, was born in 1915 and studied the Palmer method as a schoolgirl. This style of penmanship was promoted in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It was a simplified version of Spencerian. The Palmer method became the most popular handwriting system in the United States. And with this method, more of the upper muscles of the arm were used for movement rather than the fingers. It was plainer and faster than Spencerian and it allowed the writer to effectively compete with the typewriter. It emphasized regimentation, which educators thought would be useful in schools to increase discipline, character, and even help reform delinquents. Imagine that. <laughs> Look at the posture of the children's bodies and their hands. And then also note the bottles of ink and pens. When I showed mother this photo, she said to me, I can still feel Mrs. Brown's ruler hitting my knuckles. <laughs> it is probably why I have such bad arthritis. <laughs> Palmer was lovely, but not as elegant as Spencerian. Nonetheless, mother, who lived to be 99 and a half and was famous for her thank you notes, always had a legible, consistent hand and took pride in it. So there was this strong awareness of the port importance of penmanship in my family. The Palmer method began to fall out of popularity in the 1950s and was eventually replaced by the Zaner Blozer method, which taught children manuscript or block letters before teaching them cursive. As a grade schooler, that loopy style of the 1960s did not make my heart sing. And sadly, my penmanship lacked the refinement and grace of my matriarchs. Maybe I, too, needed the sting of Mrs. Brown's ruler. 
After high school, I went to college in Dallas, Texas, and I received a BA in art with an emphasis in graphic design. And as an ambitious college grad in 1977, I packed my Nova Coupe and headed to Bozeman, Montana so that I could learn to snow ski. Eventually, I ended up working at Montana State University and ran the poster shop. This was a one-person service that provided posters and flyers for campus events. And my new office was a windowless former janitor closet. It would be at MSU that I had a letter writing experience that changed the course of my life. One day, my boss asked if I knew how to do calligraphy. He needed two certificates, about six lines each. I lied. He left. I walked across the hall to the bookstore and bought a speedball lettering book, a bottle of ink, and a pen. After a laborious process of tracing, enlarging, and reducing, I completed the project. It took me 16 hours. But he was a happy customer. Word got out, and the requests started coming. Signs began springing up all over the Student Union building. Most often, I did them with markers, outlining and filling in, but always tracing. My calligraphy career began with a lie, but it proved to be the best untruth I ever uttered. In 1980, I saw an art show at MSU that rocked my world. It was a gallery full of calligraphy by two Montanans, Annie Sakali and Denny Taipola. At that moment, I realized I was a fraud. This was the real thing, and it humbled me to my core. I wanted to make letters like that. I decided that I would seek out one of these women and study with her. Unbeknownst to me, but not to my mother, was the fact that my cousin was a full-time calligrapher in Washington, D.C. Joan Pennington was leaving her position at Tolly's Calligraphy Studio to start a freelance business. I contacted her and the owner, who said to come east and give it a try. If I did well, I had a job. So in 1981, thanks to Joan, I moved from Bozeman to DC with great optimism and convinced that I could learn it all in six months and move back to Montana. Was I naive? My boss, William E. Tolley, was a second generation calligrapher. His father, Adrian, was the official White House calligrapher from Wilson through Eisenhower. William Tolley followed in his father's footsteps and started his studio in 1946. He worked out of his home at first, attracting clients by word of mouth, and then in 1959, he opened a small studio in the district three and a half blocks from the White House. He employed five to six full-time calligraphers, most of whom learned their craft from him, and most importantly, a proofreader. The front, light-filled space was their art gallery. The middle room housed a frame shop, and like medieval monks, we scribes were delegated to the windowless grotto far in the back. The Tollies had contracts with hundreds of governmental agencies and departments, trade unions, corporations, etc. It was a thriving business. We did certificates that ranged from the Pipe Fitters Union of America to presidential appointment certificates from the White House. I was taught different styles of calligraphy by the scribe in the studio who was most skilled at that hand. They would make an exemplar from which I would model my letter forms. Sometimes directional notation was made and sometimes not. If I had questions, I could ask, but everyone was focused on production, and Mrs. Tolley, who ran the show, was a harsh taskmaster. I began with a tall stack of the least profitable certificates. Once proficient, I could move on to another hand and another stack. Each time, a fellow scribe made me a new letter guide. Our salaries were based on productivity. Speed was essential, and unfortunately, that attribute was not my strength. But accuracy was, and eventually, I could work on presidential appointments and one-of-a-kind formal resolutions. That was a high point. By West Coast standards, it was an unusual education, 
And although I would not trade that experience for anything, years later when I became a calligraphy teacher, I realized I did not have those voices in the back of my mind telling me the whys and hows of letter making. My education was trial by fire. Eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, and to think I thought I could master it in six months. It would be another two and a half years later in 1983 that I bid farewell to one Washington and moved to the other where I was married and began work as a freelance calligrapher in Seattle. But I had to relearn calligraphy in the Northwest. Very few designers wanted those tight, precise styles of our nation's capital. The look of the 80s in the Northwest was bold and expressive. I had to take those tight, often retouched letter forms and shoot them with adrenaline, give them some personality. I only knew classical, but I had to learn to play jazz. In 1986, we moved to Portland, where I continued to freelance until another encounter altered the course of my life. In the late 80s, I showed my portfolio to a Portland designer, and she mentioned that the Pacific Northwest College of Art, or as it was called back then, the Museum Art School, was looking for a typography instructor and that I should consider teaching there. I had no teaching credentials and knew next to nothing about the subject. Regardless, I met with a department head. He saw promise and hired me. My learning curve was double black diamond steep. But in time, I came to a vital realization. I loved teaching. I never set out to do it. Once again, it was trial by fire, but I was hooked. Those five years at PNCA stretched me. I was a student with them, barely a step ahead. It was there that I came to believe that no matter what background it is that you bring to calligraphy and typography, Learning to draw, to understand line, will enhance your letter making. We are not all gifted draftsmen, but if we exercise this skill, we will improve our ability to think visually, to design, to lay out, to communicate, and to execute our creative ideas. I always tell students that if they want to improve their calligraphy, take a life drawing class. You study the model and mimic what you see, just like calligraphy. That job ended when computer graphics took hold, the need for the hand was degraded, and I was out a job. But that experience later led to other teaching positions. During my 27 years in Portland, I also taught at the Oregon College of Art and Craft, Portland Community College, and Sitka Center for Art and Ecology, where I still conduct workshops every summer. In my teaching bag of tricks, I have two essential tools. One arrived in a moving van, and one was discovered in the bottom of an old trunk, long neglected. In 1985, my grandmother passed away, and later, my mother sent us a moving van full of her belongings. As we unloaded it, I came upon an old, worn ledger that grandmother had kept for my grandfather's business in the 1930s. It was tattered and heavy, and my first thought was, why would mother send me this? What was she thinking? But as soon as I opened it, her intent was clear. For within those pages lay grandmother's ornate Spencerian script. And what touched me most was that these pages were never intended to be viewed by others, but she cared so deeply about her handwriting that she filled a humble ledger with elegant penmanship. This was extraordinary. My former student, Tim Lee, eloquently put it this way. What Rebecca saw were not only words, numbers, and texture, but an almost tangible desire to bring beauty and grace to an ordinary activity of life, to contribute something special to performance of a daily task, and in so doing, make it memorable. No acclaim required. This simple book encapsulates a lost era, and I have used it to inspire hundreds of students to become self-conscious of their handwriting. It is my most treasured teaching tool. It was always with me on the first day of calligraphy class at Portland Community College. Before I dismissed class, I called everyone up to my table and I told them the story of grandmother. 
I explained the importance of penmanship in her day and demonstrated with a script pen, then opened the old battered ledger. I told them, this is what we have lost, the touch of the hand. The information on these pages is mundane, but what she did with it was artful. It mattered to her. It was my hook. Their eyes widened, necks craned. Those pages said more than any words I could impart. They got it. The first day of each term at PCC when taking role, I asked my students, what brings you to calligraphy class? And their responses would vary from, I want to improve my handwriting, I want to use it as a tattoo artist, I want to decorate cakes with text. Never though has a reply inspired me, impressed me the, like the one that the quiet man with the French accent gave. In my 35 years as a calligrapher, the story of Ibrahim Berry stands as the most remarkable calligraphy story I've ever heard. Ibrahim is from Guinea, West Africa. In the fall of 2008, when I first met him, he had recently moved to Portland to finish his degree in civil engineering and to work on a remarkable project. His people, the Fula, or Fulani, represent one of the largest tribes in Africa, numbering more than 45 million. The tribe spreads from Senegal to Eritrea. They have an oral language, Pular, but no written counterpart that corresponds completely to all the sounds of their language. But that will change, would change, as you will learn. Because Guinea was a French colony until 1958, the official language is French, so they learn French in school. They learn Arabic to speak and recite the Quran, but at home they all speak Pular. Neither Arabic nor French can match the sounds of Pular, so there is no unified writing and reading system for their language, and, their, and illiteracy is rampant among the Fula. In 1987, when Ibrahim and his brother Abdullah were schoolboys, their father served the role as the town translator and reader. If a letter arrived, he would try and decipher it for the recipient. Education was not a privilege, and many could not read, and even if they could, it was difficult because of the lack of standardization. The boys became skilled at this and eventually took over the task from their father. One day, they asked him why there was no alphabet for Pular. Ibrahim and Abdullah were troubled by this, and on that day, guilelessly set out to create a written language so people could learn to read. For several weeks, they sequestered themselves in their bedroom after school, and there, using pencils and paper, designed an alphabet and eventually developed a system of writing based on the sounds of Pular. They began by teaching their sister and their mother to read and write. This was so successful, they started teaching the women and children of their town. Ibrahim has since devoted a major portion of the last 25 years refining that alphabet and teaching others to read. They named it Adlam. It contains 28 letters, upper and lower case, with consonants and vowels, and can be written as a cursive or non-connecting. It is written right to left like Arabic. They have written a dictionary, grammar books, publications, newspapers. There are hundreds of learning centers using their alphabet and reading system, and a nonprofit organization, Winden Yangen, promotes Adlam and trains teachers. Imagine in one week a person can learn to read for the first time. A life is changed. So why did Ibrahim sign up for a humanist book hand and Roman caps calligraphy class? Prior to my course, he used his limited funds to have a font design using his ad lamb, but the results disappointed him. The forms were crude and lacked beauty. It was the font technician who suggested that he take a calligraphy class to learn about subtle nuance and detail, and that is why he ended up in my class in 2009. He followed that course with another, Unchel's. His work with a broad edge nib allowed him to refine Adlam. Thanks to the Portland Society for Calligraphy, 
Ibrahim was offered a scholarship to attend the 2012 L International Lettering Arts Conference at Reed College, where he took classes and connected with numerous calligraphy rock stars, most no notably Randy Hassan from Santa Fe. Thanks to Randy, both men were then invited to give Adlam to give an Adlam presentation at the 2013 conference in Colorado. His story needs to be told. Adlam has been encoded and included in Unicode 9.0. It will soon be available in the Android system and other Google platforms, as will the first Adlam keyboard based on the new font and codes. What began as a child's innocent question has become a cultural phenomena and is rapidly spreading in Fulani communities in Africa and around the world. Not only does ADLAM educate and inform people, it is a vital tool for the preservation of the Fula language and heritage. Although trained as an engineer, this gentle, devout man's calling in life is to lift his people out of the darkness of illiteracy. I can think of no greater endeavor. Now that's a letter story. My next letter story um, is a contemporary tale of a pen and its serendipitous origin. It was 2006 and I was teaching a workshop at Sitka Center for Art and Ecology at the Oregon coast. I was doing a demonstration using my favorite tool at the time, a cola can, a cola can pen made by Portland calligrapher Carol Dubosch. This simple tool is made from wood doweling with a piece of folded metal from a cola can taped to the end. Each pen has its own mark making quirks and Carol's pen was a particularly fine specimen. Awestruck by the results of my demo, one student, Tim Lee, asked to borrow it. I happily obliged. Tim, who is an enthusiastic sort, to put it mildly, began a vigorous pin dance across his paper. His excitement was palpable, but that thin aluminum nib could not withstand his gusto and sadly gave out. That accident marked the end of my favorite tool, but the beginning of something much greater. Mortified, he, resol he resolved to make me a new one. An unnecessary gesture, I assured him, but within a week, I would have a replacement, but not just any replacement. At the time, he did not know how he would accomplish this task, but three facets of Tim's world played into the making of my new pen. Number one, his older brother, Michael, was an accomplished mechanic and had for years been outfitting Tim's workshop with tools, one of which was an old lathe. Number two, his wife had inherited from a family business deal a stack of exotic African hardwood. It had been sitting in their garage awaiting a use. And number three, Tim, trained as a journalist and spent his career as an ad agency writer and creative director. His words, I'd forever been trying to meld letters and designs with meaning, but I own no background, no art training of any significance. I was all instinct and wishing. But that Sitka class changed him. It was his first try at calligraphy and a light switched on. Tim discovered his art form. Within days of, within days of the mishap, he had crafted his first pen. He lathed a hardwood shaft, sanded and smoothed. He hammered flat a canned food lid, cut the pin shape with metal snips, folded it and attached it to the base and added a bit of embellishment. Compared to the cola can pin, this thing was, was a thing of beauty and thus was born the first Tim pin. I loved it immediately. Not only was it beautiful, it was responsive, versatile, and fluid, and considerably more durable. It moved to the number one position as my favorite tool. I sent him a large thank you letter using it. And when Tim saw what I could make with it, he was thrilled. He said, not only had I atoned for my clumsiness, but my pen had been deemed usable by a real letter artist. And for me, important doors opened. 
I could make pens that worked. And my old quest, my own old quest to craft letters that matched messages was re-energized. From that happy accident sprang a new post-retirement career, Tim's Pens. Today, 10 years later, Tim is a renowned pen maker. Requests from all over the world come in for his exquisite pens. He estimates that he has made and sold between four and 5,000, each lovingly and individually crafted. And not long ago, he even received an order from Aleppo, Syria. After that fateful Sika workshop, Tim enrolled in my calligraphy class the fall of 2006. And here, his creative spirit found its voice in this ancient craft. He has been a student of calligraphy ever since. The pen is mighty indeed. It certainly changed the life and garage of this Portland man. I have two essential teaching tools. One is grandmother's ledger and the other a stack of old letters. As a child, I was fascinated by my great uncle Roy. Roy W. Taylor was a famous cartoonist in the late 1800s and early 1900s, which was known as the pioneer age of American cartoon history. He died in 1914 at the age of 37. Two scrapbooks full of his cartoons had been put together by his adoring sister, Edna, my father's aunt. When she passed, dad inherited her belongings and thus I grew up admiring Uncle Roy's deaf skills as an illustrator and thanks to those two, bo thanks to those two books. But all I really knew of him was that he was famous, he died young, and I dearly loved how he drew dogs. Fast forward to 2002. My family and I were visiting my brother in Pennsylvania. Living the closest to West Virginia, much of our family memorabilia ended up in Bob's basement. I am intrigued by family history and decided to sort through an old trunk one winter day while visiting them. Little did I know that buried treasure awaited. At the bottom lay a worn leather pouch that had belonged to Edna. Inside it was an eclectic assortment of ephemera. But in the very back, lovingly stored, were 18 letters written by Roy, dated 1897 to 1899, all written to his sister and mother, my great-grandmother. He was in his early 20s, living in Chicago, attending art school, working hard, just at the beginning of his career. These epistles express a deep longing for his family in Richmond, Indiana. They provide a lens into his daily life. They are full of news and commentary on politics, boxing, his projects, love, loneliness, how he can't afford a haircut. Mail was his lifeline to home, and that sentiment is clear. Not only did he write with wit and cleverness, they were full of his illustrations. They always had a general, generous left margin and closed with lovingly Roy. I could not get enough of him. I read and reread them repeatedly that day and for months to come. Here was an intimate view into a time long past these 18 letters brought to life a man who had been lost to me. The following year, my daughter researched, her Uncle, Roy, uh, researched Uncle Roy for an eighth grade project. Her contact with cartoon historian Alan Holtz shed more light. He wrote to Claire, I've been researching comic strips for many years now, and occasionally people ask me, which cartoonists of the past I'd most like to have the chance to interview. I always say it has to be R. W. Taylor. But he has always been a mystery. I've never found even a short bio on him. It may seem silly to you, he said, but I literally jumped out of my chair when I read your letter and discovered that his first name was Roy. He never signed his first name, just Taylor. She sent him copies of the letters. So not only did those letters give us a new relative, they enlightened, enlightened the annals of cartoon history. 
It is true. A letter is like a frozen conversation. In 2008, Jim Carman, the special, special collections librarian at the Multnomah County Library, wrote an article in the Oregonian entitled, Dear Readers, the Letter Must Not Die. He writes, a letter is a physical object that for some of us has importance beyond the duration of our lives. He is concerned with that the practice of letter writing is dying and that we are shifting from the physical to the virtual with email. Letters are an invaluable resource. For poets, writers, scholars, and historians, the demise of handwritten correspondence will have a lasting impact. He concludes with, just as there is a slow, foods move, slow food movement to counteract fast food and fast life, Perhaps we should begin a slow writing movement to regain the appreciation of writing letters as an important meditative and historically significant activity. Jim makes a powerful argument. After reading this, I had a revelation and I began an ongoing assignment with my PCC calligraphy classes. On the first day, as I mentioned, I introduced my students to grandmother's ledger. On the second week, I brought the pouch of Uncle Roy's letters and told his story. I then gave them a voluntary assignment. For every handwritten letter or postcard that they wrote and posted, I gave them a point. Each week when I took the roll, I marked it down. I did not need to see the letters. It was on the honor system and it did not affect their grade. At the end of the term, whoever had written the most letters received a letter writing prize. Not everyone participated, but in those five years, 2,564 handwritten letters were composed and mailed. The most poignant story to come out of this was Ashley's, and this is my last letter story. For Ashley, unfortunate circumstances had divided her family for 12 years because of this, she had lost the closeness of her grandmother. It was a relationship that she desperately missed. She decided to use this assignment as a way to reconnect with her grandmother who, had been, who was then 93. These are Ashley's words. You encouraged us to write letters to loved ones to create that personal connection in a world lacking meaningful interaction. The first person I thought to write was my grandmother, but due to the situation involving our relationship, I didn't know how well it would be received. Ashley never knew her grandfather, only through stories. So she posed questions about him as the segue back into her grandmother's life. She felt it was a safe topic. It was. That letter softened her grandmother's resolve and open her heart. She even let Ashley borrow her grandfather's diary. Not only did I gain knowledge of my family history, she said, but I also gained my relationship with my grandmother again. She called me this week, the first time in 12 years. She said she appreciates my letters and that she made me some canned tomatoes, okra, and dilly beans, the three things I grew up helping her make in the kitchen. Who knew a simple letter could change your whole life and relationship with a person? I cannot thank you enough for encouraging us to write letters. I got back far more than I ever imagined I could, especially from a simple letter. The old saying is true, the pen is mightier than the sword. Letters in all their forms comprise the thread that has run so true throughout my life. Letters have connected me to both my personal history and a broader history and led me on unintended career paths. They have given me focus and in the process widened and enriched my world. I am forever grateful. As I close letter stories, I leave you with this thought written in 1940 by the English potter Bernard Leach. If today we knew something about the craftsmanship of our own writing, it would provide us with a reasonable point of departure for the investigation of a more highly developed art. But very few of us do, 
and a suspicion arises that there may be something the matter with a people who have become literate and yet lost their skill with the pen. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi. Hi. My name's Karen. And I have to tell you, first of all, I have taken a calligraphy, calligraphy cl uh, class. It was very difficult. But, uh, my daughter loves pens, buys them, writes her letters by hand instead of typewriter and so forth. But I just want to say that I read the other day, and I can't remember where, that they were going to bring cursive back into the schools. Have you heard anything about that? In, in Oregon? I, well, the only magazine I read is The Economist, so okay. maybe it was, <laughs> I don't know where. Well, there, um, it used to be in Portland Public Schools when my um, oldest son was younger and partially through my middle child, but um, then it was dropped, the curriculum was dropped, and it was devised by Barbara Getty and Inga Dubay, who are both longtime calligraphers and educators in Portland. And um, Inga has been working on new texts for teaching um, cursive, and she has a whole curriculum, they have a whole curriculum um, on writing, italic handwriting, and, um, and it's, I know it's used in other places, and I, I, it would be wonderful, I know it's been adopted some places, and the interesting thing is they also travel around, they do these two-hour improve your um, penmanship courses every year, they used to do them at P um, Portland State, and I don't know where they do them now, but, um, and they go around the world teaching physicians how to improve their handwriting. <laughs> and, and a doctor came up to them and told them that they have saved more lives than he ever will. So it's, a, it's really important. And I know, that, uh, I know that my children, other than my daughter who cared about it, my, my sons can't. They're, they have horrible penmanship. And I, don't, and I think most kids do. So I think it would be a great thing to have in. Yeah, my name is uh, David. I was at the coast last spring, and I picked up a bunch of large feathers, and when we came home, I made a pen out of one of those and tried it, and it actually works. Have you ever done that? You know, I haven't, and um, there are a lot of scribes that that's all they work with are quills, and because you, you can get such a fine line, and then you just keep honing it, you know, you keep cutting it and keeping it really sharp. And so it's, I think it's much more superior and flexible um, than a metal nib, and a lot of scribes prefer that. Uh, and they'll, you know, they treat their own, and because you have to expose them to sand, you have to heat them and all this sort of stuff to get them. Uh, it's very specific. I don't know if you did that or not, but... Uh, Anyway, they're, they, it's, a, it's kind of an involved process for treating quills, and I have not done that, nor have I written with one either. I would love to, though. This is Irene, and my sister taught for many years, and she, it was never part of the curriculum in Southern California. She taught it as, she thought it was so important, she taught it as part of the art curriculum. Oh, and really? so teachers can get away with it if they wish to. Uh -huh. um, also, um, I don't know if you saw, but a mm, couple years ago, or maybe more, I don't know, there, were, uh, there was a really interesting article in the New York Times about how important the research was that the art, uh, doing the calligraphy uh, trains an area of the brain that helps people organize everything, and how <coughs> losing the, um, the, that skill actually has a difficult effect on children that it, it does it has a great benefit and so I cut it out and brought it to the principal and of course I knew it was useless but I said look at this read this article pass it around <laughs> I don't I think it's a losing game though people just love this texting and you know well it's easy to do and the, the smart phone phones spell the words for you <laughs> yeah I, there was, I read an article, and I don't know if it was the same one, but I cut out uh, maybe t seven, eight years ago, and I used to bring it into my class, too, and, it was, and read it to them because it was the same sort of premise that it's really, and I wonder if it's the same article. And I think that Inga and Barbara Getty are mentioned in that article. If you still have it, look and see. 
Hi, this is Don. Uh, first, an anecdote, then a question. Uh, third grade, uh, January this year, Salem, Oregon. New student coming in to third grade, and the teacher has them sign in, go up to the board and actually sign in. And so uh, just uh, for all sorts of clever reasons, I think, and my, uh, my third grade grandson, who had just transferred from his education in Turkey, an international school, just <laughs> wrote in cursive <laughs> up there and was an immediate sensation. Uh, oh, I love it. Uh, That's because really he needed great. to interpret it. <laughs> uh, my, my question is uh, it looks like even keyboarding is going out too, real rapidly, a as the, the voice interpretation. Oh. Uh, you know, I know as a. a, a someone who just has a, a kind of a message phone at the moment and moving that anyone who calls and leaves me a message, I get the translation. I get, I get you know, sometimes I can't make out who call other than the number. But, but then yesterday when I'm uh, at the, at the uh, store for the cable, uh, Comcast cable, uh, it shows me how you just talk to your remote. You you know no no doesn't appear it, it doesn't keyboard. appear that keyboarding is going to last very long either. Y you got some thoughts about that? Well, I'm such a dinosaur when it comes to all that technology. I mean, I'm still texting like this, and I watch my kids go, <laughs> you know, that sliding thing. So I mean, I'm, I'm I'm like back ten years. So yeah, no, I think it's I think it's really sad, and I kudos to your grandson and tell him to spread be an evangelist for handwriting because I think we need it and I, you know my my one hope is that there's this whole generation of young people that um, are really into do it yourself you know the DIY and that um, and I think I think all those hand things and canning and you know hand doing things by hand and craft are really starting to be embraced more and more and they kind of have the this sense of like they discovered it and that's great because I I think they should be you know I think we all should take pride in that stuff so that's my hope and my one worry is when I go to these calligraphy gatherings it's like all people our age you know and whenever I see somebody young I'm like oh, Yes, welcome, you know, just it's so nice to have you here. We need more young blood. So it's like we really do have to, I, I don't want it to, I don't want it to die. And techno, it's going to always be a battle with technology. And it's brought a, light, a lot of great things, but, but you know, yeah, no, no solutions. Hi, this is Maureen. I noticed in your slide of the children in the classroom, that every single child was holding his pen or pencil in the right hand. And as a left-handed person, oh. I wanted to find out what your experience has been in teaching young people calligraphy if they're left-handed, and I am. Well, yeah, and it's funny because Jinx and I were just talking about this today because she's left-handed. So there is a wonderful calligraphy pen called a pilot parallel pen and it um, and it works really well you're not dipping it you fill a cartridge and so you're not dipping it and it allows you to make letters well now in the last few years they've started making it all and and left-handed people could use the regular one but now they make a left-handed nib meaning that the it's cut in a you know obliquely at the other side and um, and it is like the best tool and every left-handed student I have that's what I I gave them and you know I always told my students that if they were left-handed I said you know you're kind of on your own there it not there is not something that works for everybody I had Tim Lee that guy who the pen maker he's left-handed and he t came to all these creative ways of doing it he would turn things upside down and write letter you know bottom to top he brought a heat gun he works with a heat gun and he just dries his letters as he's going so he's not smearing the ink he writes right right to left you know he he has done all sorts of things so i've had some really remarkable left-handed calligraphy students but it's true it's it definitely you have more challenges um, doing that, but it is completely possible. But uh, one thing I would just say is, you know, try turning, try, try turning your paper different ways. 
you know, I, I don't think there are any fast rules. I think it should be whatever works for you and doesn't allow your hand to, you know, cramp up, it's, you know, that you can get a position that's comfortable for you, you're not gonna injure your hand, and that'll allow you to make forms. But I have a, um, I have a student who then went on to make this beautiful exemplar for using Roman caps, upper and lowercase, uh, and humanist book hand cap, um, letter forms, and she put all the notation about um, how to how to make those letters, and and she could make letters equally as better than most of my right-handed calligraphers. So, don't give up on it. But yeah, I'm sure in Mom's day, Mrs. Brown's ruler, like she probably was doing hitting more than their knuckles. You know, yeah. You look at the regimentation in that classroom, and then even the art in the back back wall. Everything is exactly the same. You know, it's just. Oh, this is Paul. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, but in 1991 there was a book published called The Minutes of the Lead Pencil Club, and it's 65 or 67 different very short essays on the importance of writing letters, you know, writing oh. as opposed to, so you might check it out on Minutes of the Lead Pencil Club. Oh, yeah, thank uh, you. I, like I, I thoroughly enjoy it, some wonder wonderfully written things, but a comment on seeing good penmanship, I, in business, I had to present 150 uh, financial bonds to the city clerk of Fortuna, California. It required three signatures, all by done by the same person. And it, it took a while to do it, but what just, I can still remember it, the beautiful handwriting, the, la the 450th signature was just as clear and precise as the first signature, and I, was, I just stood back sort of in amazement. And, and it was never hurried, mm -hmm. but it, it moved Right along. So again, a very, imp uh, very impressive demonstration of, of wonderful uh, penmanship. Yeah, and it's inspiring. I mean, I used to tell my students, use your checks when you're writing a check as an opportunity to just practice. But now, like, no young people write checks. Nobody, they don't even know, my, my nephew doesn't even know how to write a check, and he's 23, you know, so it's like, that was gone. This is Harvey. Uh, I spent a career as a librarian, and on rare occasions, I would run across an old, old catalog card with beautiful penmanship on it. And uh, I recall hearing somebody say something about the librarian's hand. Is yeah. there such a thing, or was it just somebody writing with the common script of the time and doing it well? I have never heard of the librarian's hand, but I'm going to go home and look that up. But it could, it, it could have been, you know, Spencerian. I mean, it was, did it have the thicks and the thins, like those examples of grandmothers, or do you remember? There, I've only, it was a long time ago, yeah. of course. <laughs> in fact, this was way back when we used catalog cards oh. and didn't have typewriters, and there, so there were very few samples extant. Well, I there it might have I'm gonna I wanna look that up, but it very likely may have been that Spencerian hand, which was, you know, legible and elegant and and uh, so it very likely could have been some version of that, but I don't know. That's thank you. I don't know that one. And a second question here then is my handwriting is atrocious. The ugliest thing I've ever seen on paper is my own signature. And when I was in college, my handwriting was so bad that I felt that filling out a blue book was appropriate punishment for the teacher <laughs> asking that particular <laughs> question. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let's say, what would it take, or how long would it take, or how many hours, years would it take for a person like me with really bad handwriting to develop a, a, a legible hand? Well, I think you guys need to get Inga Dubé down here and Barbara Getty to do a presentation on their um, Improve Your Handwriting program, and they do a two-hour course. And I, I mean, I've seen people like walk out of there with different different hand. You know, it's it's like re retraining. There, all that muscle memory is in there of bad penmanship. You know, and so you've got to you've got to start looking at letters differently. I mean, I had a I had a student in a uh, at PNCA that said to me, she goes, when we were learning calligraphy, she said, I feel like I'm in kindergarten all over again. I mean, I'm learning my ABCs because you have to relearn how to make A through Z 
completely, you know, because you've been making them that way forever, right? And so you've got to relearn it. But I would honestly get them down here. It's a really amazing thing what they're doing. And, and then have them do a two-hour two hour improve your handwriting class. And you will be a change man. <laughs> <laughs> you will be healed. <laughs> okay, Rebecca. This, oh. Okay, Rebecca, I'm here. It's Jinx, right? Oh, okay. Okay, um, I got caught up with calligraphy in the Portland area the, the late 60s, and my mother did through me, and then my, mo my mother went on to take a graphology, which to the uninitiated is uh, interpreting your handwriting to find out what's going on in your life. I started typing my letters home after oh. that. <laughs> I would like you to speak just briefly to your work, which doesn't look like anybody else's. It's so distinct. How do you go through the process that we're even looking at right here? Well, this piece is called College Rule, and it's, you know, for the College Rule paper, and it's based on my first memory of writing. I was, I don't know if I was five years old or even a little younger, but I, I would go to my friend's house and we would go in her basement and we would take our older sister's old um, notebooks that were in the, on all the empty pages and we, and we would play school down there with these old notebooks and we would sit there in these chairs, you know, and upright and, and we, would, we would pretend like we knew how to do cursive. And so I would just do this gestural script that was just, oh, I would do this gestural script that was just, you know, it had no meaning. It just had longing. It was just me wanting to be able to write cursive and fast like my sister did, you know, and not print out. And, um, and so that's what, this was based on that memory. It's all drawn in paint. It's not actually collaged on there. But, um, and, and so it's funny because now, as an artist, I use a lot of those kind of gestural marks in my work that I was making at age five, you know, when I really wanted to know how to write. And now I know how to write, but I still go back to that kind of long, you know, that just energetic kind of. And <clears throat> I'm Bob. And this isn't the first time that uh, writing, the loss of beautiful writing uh, was noted and, and missed. And the first time, I learned in uh, the, the Gutenberg's Apprentice book was when uh, the uh, illuminators of the script, the writers, had to face the printing press. And uh, the story actually talks a lot about the crisis that this uh, writer, who was hired by Gutenberg because of his script, to develop a script for printing, how, how the difficulty he had in letting go of the writing to go to typeface. Oh. I can imagine, wow. Huh. So, um, yeah, I guess that's sort of what we... And the, the fear would be they would lose the skill. Yeah. Because typeface would get rid of it. And they did, and you know, they did and they didn't. I mean, because then it was revived again, you know, with the um, arts and crafts movement brought that revival back and England is where it had a big, and then, um, and then the, in the West Coast, Lloyd Reynolds at, uh, you know, in the, 1960s, 70s, 80s was inspiring students at Reed College, and and Steve Jobs went on and designed, you know, Apple. Who was a student of Lloyd Reynolds, uh, went on to design, use italic forms to to give, uh, keep you know the fonts some calligraphic grace. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess it it's all we we're always going to be battling that, aren't we? <laughs> Well, last uh, very interesting presentation, but we've run out of time. So uh, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Cool.